job. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dear viewers, my dear students, colleague teachers, wherever you are, once again, it's my pleasure reaching out to you. This is Mr. Ogada, a teacher of history and government at Alliance High School, and uh, presenting to you the analysis of KCSE 2022 History and Government Paper 2. Remember, it's been a series of presenting the different sections to you. And now we are coming to the tail end of now looking at Paper 2, Section C. We'll be tackling questions number 22, question number 23, and question number 24. And as usual, I normally like setting a few rules in answering the questions in this section. One, most of these questions tackle on government issues. Section C will handle government issues. That is number one. Number two, the examiner will present you with three questions, 22, 23, 24. But the instruction is you're supposed to choose only two. So if you choose to do question 22, you do part A and part, and part B. That is as, a, as one question. Then you have a choice of choosing either question 23 or 24, depending with the ease of how you look at those questions. Again, I normally emphasize to students that please choose questions that can score you more marks. Do not rush to do a question simply because part A of it is easy. That part A of the question is easy, and then when you now begin answering or attempting part B, you get stuck. Weigh both parts of the question and see which one can score you more marks for your advantage in this particular uh, paper. Then also section C, you'll find us using especially the part B part of the question, explain, discuss, describe, where you expect to give a statement and at least a justification or you illustrate. You give us examples in answering those questions. So straight away, let's go to question number 22. Part A, identify three political parties in India. This question has been drawn from the topic electoral process and the functions of governments in other parts of the world where we learn about government issues of USA, United States of America, government issues in Britain, and then we have this classic example of India, India that is drawn from the Asian world. So what were the political parties or what political parties do we have in India? One, we have the Communist Party of India, CPI, no abbreviation. Congress Party or the Indian National Congress Party. Then we have the Bharatiya Janata Party, BJ, uh, BJP. Then we have regional parties or that are, can also be called Dravida Munetra Kazagam Party, DMK. India Anna, the Telegen Desam, Akaldai. Then we have the National Conference. So you need to know these political parties, please. Always take care of the strokes. A stroke simply means that that point that comes after the stroke can be used as an alternative. It's not a standalone point because some of you may always choose to just break this point into different points. You'll end up missing your marks. So that is what was expected of you from that particular question. Part B, functions of the president of India, again from the same, same topic, functions of the president of India. Very special question because even in most of our textbooks, you will not really find explicit subtopic talking about the president of India. Actually, most of us, we have always known that India only has a prime minister. But for your information, India has a president. Actually, even if I was to ask you to give me the name of the president of India, most of you will not even be acquainted with it. And therefore, uh, dear students, dear colleague, teachers, and my viewers, we now have this very special question that was brought in last year's KCSE 2022 on the functions of the president of India, where number one, he or she appoints the prime minister 
who runs the government. It's the president that appoints the prime minister, of course, from the party with the majority of members in their parliament. He or she nominates the 12 members of the Council of States. They nominate that group of people, establishes special councils to arbitrate on interstate conflicts, establishes special councils to arbitrate on interstate conflicts, where if, they are, if the states that exist within India have issues to sort out, then the president is supposed to come up with this special council to arbitrate and to bring peace. Uh, the president is a symbol of unity, thereby bringing people or holding people together, a symbol of unity. Uh, when they speak, they don't speak to represent views of their political parties. They speak to represent the views of the uh, India as a country. Therefore, they are supposed to unite, not to divide. Then he, he or she declares a state of emergency if necessary. The president has the powers to declare a state of emergency. Appoint state governors or Supreme Court judges who assist in the running of the country. So the president has that uh, function. He or she opens or dissolves parliament either when its term ends or if there's sufficient reason to do so. The president opens or dissolves parliament as need dictates. Uh, he or she participates in lawmaking by assenting or signing bills into law. He or she participates in lawmaking by assenting or signing bills into law. So no bill can be a law, can become a law unless it has the presidential assent. The same also applies to us here in Kenya. These bills need to be assigned, to be signed, sorry, by the president. Unless under very special circumstances where the president declines, then it's taken back to the house, it's discussed one time, two times, three times, then finally it will the uh, generate as a law of the republic without the presidential assent. But I'm saying that they're supposed to sign these bills into law. Then he or she exercises power of mercy or to pardon people who had been sentenced. Again, that is also applicable to our case in Kenya. He's the commander-in-chief of the armed forces in, in India. Again, a point well explained. Remember also our president in the republic is the commander-in-chief. He or she makes regulations for certain union territories, certain union territories that are unable to have these regulations to govern them, then the president steps in. He or she is the leader of the party that nominates him or her for election. He automatically becomes the party leader of that particular party that nominates him or her for elections in India. Then the president represents India in international functions. The president represents India in international functions. Very, very clear. Question number 23. Identify three categories of persons who are not allowed to contest for parliamentary seats in Britain. Identify three categories of persons who are not allowed to contest for parliamentary seats in Britain. This, again, drawn from the same topic of electoral process and functions of governments in other parts of the world. These are the answers provided. One, aliens or foreigners. They are not allowed to contest for parliamentary seats. Number two, Members of the House of Lords, so the nobles, or so the peers, they are not allowed. Remember, we have the House of Lords and House of Representatives. House of Lords are members that qualify to be part of the House under very special circumstances, like through appointments, nominations. They are a very special group of people. They are not allowed to contest parliamentary seats in Britain. Then clergy of the churches of Scotland, England, Ireland, and the Roman Catholic Church. They are not allowed to participate in elections. Public officers, judges, civil servants, members of the armed forces. Actually, like even in Kenya, if you want to vie for a public office, then you have to resign within a stipulated timeline. So the same applies to these people in Britain. This group of people are not allowed to contest for parliamentary seats unless they resign, they resign under the law. Persons declared bankrupt. You are declared bankrupt, 
you don't qualify because they believe that you are likely to go into those offices to simply enrich yourself and save yourself from the bankruptcy. Then persons who have committed ele electoral offenses or corrupt individuals, they are not allowed to. Uh, they are not allowed to vie for those parliamentary seats. Members of the royal family, members of the royal family, they are exempted. A person serving a jail term of more than one year is also exempted. A person of unsound mind or incapacitated persons or insane, they are also not allowed to participate in elections. Part B, functions of the Congress in the United States of America. Functions of the Congress in the United States of America. One, it appoints commissions of inquiry to investigate any issue of national concern. It appoints commissions of inquiry. Remember, in the U.S., we have two houses of parliament. We have the Congress and then we have the Senate. The Congress is the one that handles issues of national uh, concern, where people are elected as members of the Congress and then they now represent their constituents at this national forum. So they are the ones who appoint commissions of inquiry to investigate such issues. It amends the law with approval of all the states, of all the states of America. Right now, there are about 51 or 52 states. So they are the ones who make and amend those laws. Approves taxation measures which enables the government to raise revenue to finance its operations or programs. No taxes can be levied on the citizens of U.S. without it being passed by the members of the Congress. It confers, confirms senior public officers appointed by the president. The president nominates, then the Congress, uh, the Congress vets or approves, then the, pre the president finally comes to appoint. So there's the nomination, there is the vetting, or the approval by the Congress members, then the president simply does the appointment. It represents the interests or aspirations of the American people. It represents the interests or the aspirations of the American people, makes laws which govern the country or regulate actions or conduct of the people. It's the lawmaking organ of the United States uh, government. It approves the making of treaties between the USA and other nations, that no treaties can be signed between the government of the USA and any other government without the ratification of the Congress. It checks the executive arm of government in order to promote transparency. It checks the executive arm of government in order to promote transparency or accountability or efficiency in service delivery. So it provides some checks and balances to the executive arm of government in the U.S. It also admits new states into the union. We have a, a state that has come up, then it is now admitted into the United States of America Union, done by the Congress. It declares war against their enemies or establishes or maintains or controls the USA armed forces. It's very, very powerful. Very, very powerful in terms of regulating even how the armed forces of the USA operate. Lastly, question number 24. Part A. Give three characteristics of human rights. This question was drawn from the topic democracy and human rights. Remember, I mentioned that this topic is largely paper one. Democracy and human rights is largely paper one, but it is also a shared topic between paper one and paper two. Why? Issues like human rights are universal. Democracy or democratic principles are also universal. So it can they can comfortably fit in either paper one or paper two, depending on the examiner's choice of where they want to place them. So what are the characteristics of human rights? One, they are indivisible. Human rights are indivisible. 
you cannot separate or divide these rights and say you will enjoy this and not enjoy this. You in, indivisible. Number two, they are universal or they apply equally to all people. It, it does not discriminate. Human rights should not discriminate. Then they have limitations. Actually, we normally say that you only enjoy your right up to that point where you do not infringe on the rights of other people. Your right is only your right to the extent that it does not infringe on the rights of other citizens. Human rights can be suspended or derogated. Yes, like when we have, let's say, a state of emergency, your right to move, your freedom of movement association, limited or suspended, or depending on how you have abused that right, you can, you can say, we are going to suspend the right to life for you. Why? You have killed somebody else. So the law takes course. They are inherent or inborn or integral. Meaning as long as you are living, you are a born, uh, you are a living creature, you enjoy human rights. Lastly, part B, reasons why the United Nations Charter on Human Rights is important. The document that consolidates all human rights in the entire universe. Why is it important? Number one, it promotes policies or strategies geared towards eradication of poverty in the society to make human life better. Number two, it promotes good governance by advocating for equitable distribution of resources in the society. Remember the word is equitable distribution of resources where there are no elements of discrimination. It promotes peace or security in the society by encouraging respect for human rights. That's why you'll always find that in these countries where we have wars, we have conflicts, we have, let's say, ethnic violence, people fighting against each other, the UN must always come in and speak. Why? Because it has a mandate of, you know, promoting peace or security in the society and encouraging people to respect uh, rights of each other. Then it encourages protection of the rights of the vulnerable groups or me uh, members of the society in order to prevent violation or abuse of their rights. Remember, we have different vulnerable groups within the society and especially persons that are abled differently or persons with disability, the UN has to have a voice in terms of their protection. Rights of children, rights of women, rights of the aid, you know, these are special groups of people. So the UN has a mandate to come very, very strongly to defend the rights of these people. Then it promotes the development, it promotes development by addressing issues of discrimination in employment opportunities or exploitation. Remember, it has that organ called the International, the UN as the organ of International Labor Organization, ILO. ILO stands to defend the rights of workers globally. No issues of exploitation at places of work, discrimination, you know, workers doing long hours without any adequate compensation. So the UN Charter on Human Rights addresses issues of discrimination in employment opportunities. Then it advocates for humanitarian assistance to the needy, people affected by disasters or calamities, thereby easing their suffering. They help people that come from you know, places that maybe have been affected by natural calamities. Then it has led to the promotion of women's rights or empowerment by advocating for gender equality, protecting women's rights. It encourages or adv advocates for provision of education to all in order to empower them or improve their social welfare. Encourages or advocates for provision of education to all in order to empower them or improve their social welfare. Education for all. Remember, like even in, in, uh, in uh, our country, we have the UNESCO, the body that advocates, you know, matters of education, scientific innovation and research. Then it forms the basis of human rights 
legislations made by other countries or institutions. Meaning that every country that draws the rights of her people, it has the, you know, the document, the blueprint, the document of the UN Charter to at least benchmark on that as you draw your rights as a country for your people, you know, you have the guiding principle from the United Nations Charter. So therefore it becomes a basis for human rights legislations made by other countries. You cannot make laws or human rights or freedoms that contradict whatever are stipulated in the UN Charter of Human Rights. It's, it's, very, it's a very, very powerful document. It promotes good governance by ensuring that people's political rights are safeguarded. Good governance. They will always, you know, find themselves as election observers, you know, ensuring that there is no uh, abuse from government to the citizen. So that good governance prevents terrorism by undertaking human rights. Yes, preventing terrorism, very, very key. Remember, terrorism is an international issue. So therefore, the UN is there to ensure that there are no terrorism activities against human rights. It uh, promotes or promotes uh, justice by guaranteeing individuals' right to a fair trial. The issue of also promotion of justice. Remember, we have the International Criminal Court that handles uh, issues of uh, the abuse of human rights globally. And, you know, when you uh, do things that are against human rights, so therefore it has that mandate of promoting justice. Then lastly, we have uh, the last point. We have it helps to promote territorial integrity and sovereignty through self-determination, where there is no body that should be subjected to any form of colonization, detention, slavery. So it's the work of the United Nations, the, the work of the United Nations Charter to spell out that these countries, these uh, independent states, different, different parts of the world have their territorial integrity intact, their sovereignty intact, and that they enjoy their self-determination. Dear student, ladies and gentlemen, my dear viewer, colleague, teachers, it has been a great, great pleasure coming to you with the analysis of KCC History and Government Paper 2. We have done both Paper 1 conclusively, and now today we have wrapped up Paper 2 you will find all these presentations in your educational channel in YouTube top-notch TV programs. With you has been Mr. Ogada, a teacher of history and government at Alliance High School. Thank you and God bless you and looking forward even to more interactions with you in the future. Asante ni sana, mungu awabariki.